Hi everyone. Today we will be looking at chronic kidney disease with a discussion of some of the methods of dialysis. In terms of an outline, we will start off with a brief introduction, look at the definitions of chronic kidney disease, and then move on to CKD itself in terms of epidemiology, etiology, the presentation and the initial approach, the signs and symptoms, and then lastly we will look at management, including the principles as well as a discussion of dialysis. In terms of chronic kidney disease definition, it refers to a state of irreversible kidney damage and or a reduction of kidney function which may be seen as progressive. CKD replaces the previous clinical terms of chronic renal failure and chronic renal insufficiency, and it more clearly defines kidney dysfunction as occurring on a spectrum or a continuum rather than a discrete change in kidney function. As we will see on the subsequent slide, the definition is according to set values and criteria. According to the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes 2012 classification, it considers etiology, renal function based on the GFR, and the presence and rate of albumin urinary excretion in order to define the disease. The diagnosis of pediatric CKD is based on fulfilling one of the following criteria. A GFR of less than 60 moles per minute per 1.73 meters squared for more than three months with implications for health regardless of whether other CKD markers are present or not, or a GFR greater than 60 moles per minute that is accompanied by evidence of structural damage or other markers of functional kidney abnormalities, including things such as proteinuria, albuminuria, renal tubular disorders, or pathological abnormalities detected by histology or other imaging methods. As can be seen in the table alongside, CKD is classified based on the GFR into categories G1 to G5 with decreasing levels of GFR, starting at more than 90 moles per minute and decreasing to less than 15 moles per minute. This classification system is used for children over the age of 2, and it is also used in terms of classification of the risk of progression of CKD and the complications based on a declining GFR. Furthermore, the guidelines recommend adding albuminuria categories expressed as a ratio of urinary albumin to creatinine excretion to the staging of pediatric CKD. The rationale for this addition is based on data that the level of albuminuria is predictive of mortality and kidney outcomes in adults with CKD. Although similar direct data in children are lacking, there is good evidence that the presence and severity of proteinuria are predictive of declining renal function in children. In the pediatric population, determination of urinary protein to creatinine ratios is preferred over albuminuria. As can be seen, it is classified into three different categories A1 with a normal to mildly increased proteinuria, A2 moderately increased, and finally A3 with a severely increased proteinuria of more than 300 mg of albumin per gram of creatinine. It is important to note, however, that children under 2 years old do not fit within the above classification system because they normally have a low GFR even when corrected for body surface area. In these patients, calculated GFR based upon serum creatinine can be compared with normative age-appropriate values to detect kidney impairment. The guideline suggests that a GFR value of more than one standard deviation below the mean should raise concern and prompt more intensive monitoring. We will now look at the epidemiology of CKD. In stage renal disease, or CKD stage 5, is uncommon in children, and the reported incidence varies throughout the world. The highest estimated incidence of CKD stage 5 was in children in New Zealand, with an annual rate of 18 per million children. A low annual incidence is seen in Japan with a rate of 4 per million children at or below age of 19. The differences, which particularly affected younger children, were related to economic factors. The incidence of pediatric end-stage renal disease increases with age, with the highest incidence occurring in adolescence. The variability in the incidence is thought to be due to certain genetic and environmental factors, the ability to make the diagnosis as well as to manage children with significant kidney impairment and the threshold of when RRT or renal replacement therapy is initiated. 
Obtaining accurate data is difficult. The reported number of children with pediatric CKD is likely an underestimate because early stages of CKD are usually asymptomatic and this leads to an underdiagnosis. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the lowest published rates of CKD ranged from 1 to 3 cases per million of age-related population. However, as stated above, this may be inaccurate. Other factors that can affect the epidemiology of CKD include race and genetics. We see that it is two or three times higher in the African-American population. The genotype of APOL1 might explain the increase of CKD, as there is an associated increased risk for the development of glomerular disease, particularly focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, or FSGS. Gender, we see higher rates in males than females, and this may be due to an increased rate of congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract system seen in males. And age, the largest age group affected appears to be that of between 6 years old to just below 13 years old. Let us now consider the etiology and presentation of a child with CKD. In terms of etiology, the following distribution of causes is based upon the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Registry of North America Pediatric Renal Trials and Collaborative Study. The distribution of causes varies by age. We can see that congenital renal abnormalities makes up the majority, which includes obstructive neuropathy, renal aplasia, hyperplasia, and dysplasia, functional nephropathies, and polycystic kidney disease. Glomerular disease, which is approximately 17% of cases, which is more common in older children, includes FHGS and other causes. About 25% of cases may be idiopathic or unknown, and other uncommon causes such as hemolytic uremic syndrome, genetic disorders, and hereditary nephritis and interstitial nephritis. Here we see the information represented graphically along the side. It is important to note that this information is gained from American studies, as no good studies in South Africa or within the African population has been reported. We will now consider the presentation. It's important to remember that patients with early stages of CKD are often asymptomatic. Patients with non glomerular causes of CKD may have the following at presentation if they are not diagnosed in early childhood. This includes polyuria. Many congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract are associated with reduced concentrating ability of the urine. Creatinine, they may have elevated levels of serum creatinine for their age. Growth impairment is a common manifestation of CKD, and they may have general symptoms including that of tiredness and fatigue. Children with glomerular disorders as the cause of CKD often present with more prominent signs and symptoms of kidney disease, which include systemic symptoms, findings due to concurrent systemic diseases that affect the kidney function, for example FLE, raised creatinine levels for their age, poor growth, Coca-Cola urine as a result of proteinuria and hematuria, which is a strong biomarker of CKD, and edema and hypertension. In terms of making the diagnosis of CKD, we follow the usual process of history and physical examination. This can then be further supplemented with laboratory evaluation and imaging, which is useful to determine the underlying cause of CKD, as well as determine the severity of the kidney impairment and to determine whether or not the complications of CKD are present. Starting with history, the history is focused towards the signs of CKD or factors that may increase one's risk of CKD which includes a family history, a growth history, symptoms of CKD, including elevated blood pressure, condensal abnormalities of the kidney or urinary tract, which may be known, recurrent UTI, and then unexplained anemia and fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. The physical examination is directed towards determining the complications and signs and symptoms of CKD and whether or not they are present, which may include the measurement of growth parameters, blood pressure, examining for signs of hypovolemia, pallor, cardiovascular system examination, as well as the signs of chronic kidney disease, mineral, and bone disorder, or edema. Laboratory investigations, which mainly include blood and urine studies, used mainly to support the diagnosis and assess the severity of CKD. These may include urine lipstick, blood, such as a UNE, CMP, SEC, lipid profile, 
vitamin D levels and so on, as well as a kidney biopsy. Imaging. Ultrasound is the most widely used modality which compares the length of each kidney with age normative appropriate values. It detects renal abnormalities such as cystic kidney diseases and so on. Other modalities include avoiding to see urethrogram, CT and MRI, or a MAG3 scan, which are normally used in specific clinical settings. In terms of the progression of CKD, it is thought that the progression is in part due to a final common mechanism of intraglomerular hypertension and glomerular hypertrophy. The increase in intraglomerular pressure results from systemic hypertension or via glomerular specific processes which contribute to an increased filtration in the remaining functional nephrons and an increase in glomerular size. Over time, the increased transglomerular ultrafiltration and pressure leads to glomerular damage and leakage of protein, resulting in interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. This is characterized histologically by glomerular sclerosis, vascular sclerosis, and tubular interstitial fibrosis, and clinically by proteinuria and the loss of renal function. We will now consider the complications of CKD. CKD associated complications begin to appear as CKD progresses from stage 3 onwards. In terms of the fluid and electrolyte complications, we see that the patients may become salt and fluid overloaded, particularly in the late stages of CKD. Water and sodium retention may result in fluid overload. In general, a combination of dietary sodium restriction and diuretic therapy is used to prevent this overload. Patients may become salt wasted. Some children, especially those with an obstructive uropathy, will affect the kidneys at poor urinary concentration capacity and exhibit urinary sodium wasted, resulting in a propensity for hypovolemia and hyponatremia. Electrolyte abnormalities may also be noted with hyperkalemia, which develops primarily because of an inadequate potassium excretion due to a reduced GFR. Other factors to consider would be a high dietary potassium intake, metabolic acidosis, hyperrobosteronism, or an impaired uptake of cellular potassium. Metabolic acidosis, which is characteristically present when the GFR is less than 30 or from stage 4 onwards. Acidosis is associated with growth impairment because the body utilizes the bone buffering system to bind some of the excess hydrogen ions. Current guidelines suggest sodium bicarbonate therapy is started at 1 to 2 milliequivalents per kg per day in 2 or 3 divided doses, and the dose then be titrated to the clinical target. In terms of further complications, hypertension is an incredibly common complication, one that we see a lot in our patients. It is high in patients with CKD even when the GFR is only mildly reduced, and it increases with further declines in the GFR. It is defined as a blood pressure above the 90th percentile for gender, age, and height measured on three or more separate occasions. In terms of the control in renal function, strict blood pressure control in all children with CKD is required as it slows the progression of CKD. In terms of treatment, treatment should include specification of target blood pressure levels, which should be achieved, non pharmacological therapy, and antihypertensive therapy. In terms of the targets, it remains unclear what the optimal target of BP should be in children with CKD. It is suggested that in younger children, targets of solid and diastolic blood pressure of less than the 90th percentile for age, gender and height should be aimed for. Tighter control may be required for those with significant proteinuria, and some studies have reported that we should aim for less than the 50th, sometimes less than the 75th percentile. In adolescents, a target of blood pressure of 120 over 80 is used. Therapeutic interventions include both non-pharmacological and pharmacological measures. Non-pharmacological measures include lifestyle changes, which include weight reduction, regular exercise, dietary measures, and avoidance of excessive alcohol consumption, caffeine, energy drinks, and smoke exposure, particularly in the adolescent population. Pharmacologically, our choices include an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, calcium channel blocker, beta blockers, diuretics, and alpha blockers. Based on the available evidence, the preferred choice of an antihypertensive is one that targets the RAS system, your ACE inhibitors or ARDs, which provides the added benefit of reducing proteinuria, which slows the progression of CKD. 
it is suggested that you start with an initial low dose and upsaturate it in a response, normally over a period of 4 to 8 weeks. If poorly controlled, consider adding in other agents. It is always important to consult a nephrologist in this regard. Other complications include the development of anemia, dyslipidemia, neurodevelopmental complications, as well as that of uremic bleeding. The diagnosis and management suggestions can be seen on this slide. We will now consider the management principles of chronic kidney disease. The general management principles of CKD encompass four important areas. Firstly, to treat reversible kidney dysfunction. Secondly, you want to treat the complications of CKD. Thirdly, you want to prevent or slow the progression of kidney disease. And lastly, you want to identify an adequately prepared child and their family in whom renal replacement therapy will be required. Preparation for renal replacement therapy is generally instituted once the estimated GFR is below 50 mL per minute. Some form of renal replacement therapy will generally be required when the GFR falls below 10 to 15 mL per minute or TKD stage 5. Renal replacement therapy may be instituted earlier in certain children for the following reasons, which include things such as a poor total calorie intake resulting in failure to thrive, clinical symptoms attributed to uremia, hypertension, electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities, refractory to medical therapy, as well as a delay in psychomotor development. However, early initiation at a higher GFR does not provide a survival advantage, as seen from the studies below. However, it does decrease the mortality in children who receive chronic dialysis, as opposed to those who do not. The choices of RRT in children with CKD include a kidney transplantation, hemodialysis, or HD, or peritoneal dialysis, PD. The choice varies particularly with the age and the resources available. Although HD and PD are technically feasible in children of all ages, in general, transplantation is the ultimate aim for the majority of children. Preemptive renal transplantation is the preferred RRT, which is formed prior to the need for dialysis. This is preferred because it is associated with better outcomes in health-related quality of life measures, growth and development, and a lower mortality rate. Dialysis is more disruptive to the family lifestyle, schooling, and social interactions. Avoidance of dialysis preserves vascular and peritoneal access for future use if the transplant fail, and the dietary and fluid restrictions are necessary on dialysis and dialysis is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and infective complications. The choice of dialysis modality is generally dictated by the patient's age, technical, social and compliance issues, as well as the family preference. Many studies have shown that HD is the initial RRT that is selected in Europe, United States, Australia and New Zealand. For renal replacement therapy, a certain amount of planning is required depending on the chosen modality. For HD, the children will require evaluation for vascular access. The options for which include an AV fistula or a central venous tunnel catheter. AV fistula are associated with a lower incidence of complications compared to catheters. Catheters are associated with a greater risk of infectious complications and should ideally be reserved for patients who are too small to permit surgical construction of a fistula. In terms of peritoneal dialysis, patients who are initiated on PD need to undergo abdominal surgery for the placement of the PD catheter. We will now consider peritoneal dialysis in a little bit more detail. Chronic peritoneal dialysis is the most common dialysis treatment modality used particularly to treat children under the age of 5. There have not been any comparative studies of PD and HD outcomes in children with CKD to suggest a superiority of one procedure versus the other. Both appear to have similar efficiencies and outcomes. The advantages and disadvantages of PD can be seen in the table. Advantages include having a less restrictive diet, 
The therapy can be performed at home, allowing regular school attendance and social activities, and no vascular access is required. The disadvantages include that of an increased caregiver burden, possible patient and caregiver non-adherence to prescribed therapy, and the risk of CPD-related infections, such as capitocyte tunnel infections and peritonitis. The contraindications to CPD include those conditions that affect the integrity of the abdominal cavity, which can be seen as listed below. When one considers peritoneal dialysis, there are a variety of different modalities that may be used, which include continuous ambulatory PD, which provide continuous solids and fluid removal throughout the day and night. This is a manual form of CPD, and the patient or caregiver attaches and installs a bag of sterile dialysis fluid into the peritoneal cavity multiple times per day through a surgically placed catheter, followed by drainage through the same catheter after a predetermined period of time, which is known as the dwell time. The advantages are its ease of use and the limited cost of equipment. Automated PD, which is APD, is broadly defined as all the forms of PD that employ the use of a cycler and multiple automated exchanges are performed at night while the patient is sleeping. There are currently three different options, which include multiple nocturnal exchanges, some of which may include a prolonged daytime exchange, as seen on the slide. These three options include your nightly intermittent PD, continuous cycling PD, which includes a daytime exchange, and your tidal peritoneal dialysis, which also includes a daytime exchange, but is technically more complicated. An important note on the peritoneal equilibrium test, or PET. The transport capacity of a patient's peritoneal membrane is one of the most important characteristics to consider when determining the PET prescription. This standardized test measures the small solute transport across the peritoneal membrane and the net of filtration by taking blood before a 4-hour dwell and after a 4-hour dwell with a full volume of 1.1 liters of a 2.5% dextrose-containing dialysis. This semi-quantitative assessment allows the classification of patients as rapid or slow transporters, taking the value of those blood tests that we discussed earlier and plotting them against certain published norms such as the graph as seen below. Rapid transporters are optimally dialyzed using a regimen with short dwell times as they achieve almost total equilibrium between the plasma and the dialysate for urea and creatinine within a few hours. They also rapidly absorb the dialysate glucose, which removes the osmotic stimulus to ulcer filtration. And thus the net effect is that they begin to absorb the dialysate after two to three hours, which causes a reduction in the net filtration volume, the final drain volume, and the net solute clearance whereas slow transporters are optimally dialyzed with longer dwell times, as they require the longer time to ideally remove the small solutes, which is in contrast to the above. When considering the actual prescription for peritoneal dialysis, certain elements need to be considered. Firstly, the solution that's used. There are a variety of different types of solutions that may be used, which include things such as water, buffers to control the acidosis foot, electrolytes, osmotic agents, usually dextrose in varying concentrations, 1.5, 2.5, 4.25%, and just note that increasing the osmolality will increase the net fluid removal. There is increasing evidence that prolonged exposure to standard PD solutions results in membrane injury and reduced function, especially in those patients who are exposed to frequent short cycles, such as using APD. In particular, solutions with high concentrations of glucose and lactate appear to be more injurious. The full volume. The prescribed full volume is based on the patient's body surface area. It is adjusted based on the patient's tolerance and the need for fluid and solute removal. Too small a full volume may lead to rapid solute equilibrium and thus inadequate ultrafiltration. In contrast, too large a volume can lead to excess increases in the intraperitoneal pressure which may result in certain complications, including discomfort, pain, dyspnea, hernias, gastroesophageal reflux, and so on. The exchange dwell time. Dwell times are shortened to increase the ultrafiltration and urea clearance. 
Longer dwell time exchanges, on the other hand, favor higher creatinine and phosphate clearing, but may impair ultrafiltration. The complications of PD can be viewed as infectious complications, which include peritonitis, as well as tunnel fat infection, one of the most common reasons for children being hospitalized, and the second most common cause of death in children with DKD receiving PD. Mechanical related complications, which are as a result of increased intraperitoneal pressure, such as hernias, fluid leaks, and hydrothorax, and lastly, equipment or other complications, such as catheter leakage and migration, or ultrafiltration failure. We will now consider the basics of hemodialysis. The goals of hemodialysis include effective and safe clearance of uremic toxins and the removal of excess fluids, with the additional need for the preservation of blood vessels to allow for a lifetime of renal replacement therapy. The equipment includes the extracorporeal circuit, which is composed of an arterial or inflow and venous or outflow line, and the dialyzer. A safe volume of the circuit is targeted at approximately 8% of the total blood volume of the child. The dialyzer, the type of dialyzer generally used, is a hollow fiber design that minimizes the blood volume and provides reliable and predictable solute clearance and ultrafiltration coefficients. The size of the dialyzer used is calculated by surface area. It should be as large as possible, but should not exceed that of the child's body surface area. In terms of the HD machine, the components include a blood pump to move the blood between the patient and the dialyzer, a delivery system to transport the dialysis fluid, and monitoring devices. In addition, HD machines used in children should have the following characteristics. A volumetric fluid removal system that can directly measure the ultrafiltrate volume, which is the volume that is removed during dialysis and it also must be able to remove and record very small fluid volumes. Vascular access is one of the most important factors for successful HD. Three forms of vascular access are available in children and include the central venous catheters. Globally, this is used in the majority of patients when HD is initiated. It is most commonly placed in the internal jugular vein and tunneled superficially to exit in the upper anterior chest. Sizes of the catheters range from 6.5 to 14 French and are chosen according to the vessel size and based on the weight of the child. Complications Poor function due to catheter malposition is the most frequent complication, as well as infection, which may cause subsequent vesicle damage and stenosis. Native AV fistula, which is the preferred choice if possible. However, it requires early planning because AV fistulas require time to mature before they can be used. Creating fistulas in children smaller than 15 kg is technically very difficult. They are typically constructed with an end to side, vein to artery anastomosis, and the preferred site is the radial artery and the cephalic vein. Synthetic AV graft may also be used. The AV graft is made from a synthetic inert material that can be joined to an artery as well as a vein. Complications include stenosis, thrombosis, as well as infection. When one considers the prescription for hemodialysis, the component should include the selection of the dialyzer, the tubing selection, blood flow rate, length and frequency of the dialysis session, the amount of fluid that should be removed, the dialysis composition, and whether or not to heparin. For each patient, a dialysis prescription should be developed so that there is adequate solid clearance and removal of excess fluid. In terms of blood flows, this refers to the speed at which blood is pumped out of the child and around the circuit, and this is an important determinant of solute clearance. Although higher blood volume increase the solute clearance by optimizing diffusion and convection, excessive blood flows can compromise cardiovascular stability. The blood flow speed has to be adjusted to the size of the child and should not exceed his or her maximum extracorporeal volume in milk per minute, up to 8 moles per kg per minute is accepted. The length of the dialysis and the frequency of session. Conventional dialysis generally performed three times a week with the duration of each session depending on the predetermined amount and the rate of solute clearance and fluid removal. 
an intensified dialysis link can also be instituted in which the solute clearance is greater with increasing the dialysis time. Garza has suggested that in children, the longer the dialysis time, the better the outcome. Intensified dialysis results in better phosphate and blood pressure control, improved appetite and growth, and, despite the increased time spent on dialysis, an improved quality of life. In terms of fluid removal, this is based on the difference between the pre dialectic weight and the optimal weight of the patient and whether the child has any residual fetal function or not. Although the amount of fluid that a child will tolerate losing per hour varies, a general safe starting point is approximately 10 moles per kg per hour. Removal of more than 5% of body weight in one session may result in symptomatic hypovolemia. The last few factors that need to be considered to your HD prescription include an estimation of the optimum weight. This is defined as the weight below which the child will become symptomatically hypertensive. There are various methods of determining the optimum weight. However, some of these methods may be unreliable and therefore they are not routinely used. Anticoagulation. Unfractionated heparin is the standard anticoagulant used during HD. It can be infused slowly and continuously throughout the session to prevent blood clotting within the surface and it is normally infused through the arterial side of the surface. Adequate dialysis clearance. There is a calculation that can be seen on the slide that may be used to determine whether the clearance for the child has been adequate in terms of their dialysis clearance or not. Lastly, we will consider the outcome of hemodialysis. The mortality risk for children on dialysis is 30 times higher than age and gender matched for normal children. In terms of the causes of mortality, the most common causes are cardiac arrest from unknown cause, followed by withdrawal from dialysis, and sepsis. Below is a list of references used when compiling this presentation. The presentation was aimed at giving an overview of chronic kidney disease in terms of the etiology and causes, presentation and the initial approach, as well as management principles, and a brief overview of peritoneal and hemodialysis.